Would you believe felines and rodents on water skis? Yeah, and they can ski better than most of us. Good girl. Art Torres, after 20 years in the legislature, he's really out of touch. He voted to provide workers' comp benefits to prison inmates. He voted to allow convicted sex offenders to teach in the public schools. He voted for the Inmate Bill of Rights. And Torres criticized the Three Strikes Law as a product of middle-class fears. The choice? Chuck Quackenbush, co-author of the Three Strikes Law. And he wrote the law to prosecute teenage murderers as adults. The closer you look, the clearer the choice. Student loan fraud has cost taxpayers billions. Some controversial schools are run by National Education Corporation, whose largest stockholder is Richard Blum's company, Diane Feinstein's husband. National Education got over $100 million in federal funds since Feinstein became senator. While Feinstein voted four times for the program, giving it $4 billion, her husband's company made millions from taxpayers. Feinstein, a senator who serves special interests and her own. Always Walmart. Bring home the video that will make your holidays sparkle. Joel Siegel calls it a wonderful Christmas gift. Macaulay Culkin is excellent. A classic. George Balanchine's The Nutcracker is now for sale on video. Directed by Emil Arbolino. If man were meant to fly, he would have been born with a 32 valve, 280 horsepower, Lincoln Mark 8. If you have a cat, you know sometimes they don't like getting a bath. That's for sure. But that is not the case with our next guest on Nightcast. This is Sebastian the cat. He is right at home on a pair of water skis. Sebastian's owner saved him <laughs> on the way to the pound. Now he's the main attraction in Sanford, Florida. Sebastian has several fans, even persuaded some of his wild friends to join him on the waves. Now he and Twiggy, the water skiing squirrel, will be performing at fairs around the country. <laughs> That's pretty Maybe cute. she doesn't like the water and that's why she hangs on for dear life. Well, that's a good boy. <laughs> good night. <laughs> October 26th, 1994. It's gone from being a state of enormous optimism to one that reflects the uneasy mood of the country. A mood of cynicism. Everything is literally just getting beyond our control. Of fear. Everyone is afraid to move about this state after dark. Of anger at the government. I think that the government's response to uh, uh, everyday life has been unacceptable. Tonight, the state of disenchantment, California. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Aaron Brown. Let's face it, there's no greater curse in 1994 for a politician than to be called a politician. So if you're a challenger and you really want to play dirty, hit below the belt, tell voters about your opponent's experience, the whole thing, about all the bills she wrote or the committees he serves on, that ought to do the trick. It's not that politicians used to be revered and now suddenly they're not. It doesn't seem to be as much about some burning anger as it is about disillusionment, maybe even disgust with anything having to do with government itself. Americans have long had a love-hate relationship with government. In 1994, it seems all the love is gone. ABC's Jeff Greenfield went to California to take a look, not so much at them, the politicians, but at us. He joins us from New York tonight. 
with what he's found. Jeff, good evening. Aaron, hi. Uh, what I did find is that there is this rather strange change in the national mood, and you can't find it in bolder relief than in California. And what I found most surprisingly was a very different mood in a state that's always stressed and emphasized optimism and growth and confidence in the future. You can hear that almost everywhere you go there. Yeah, when I was growing up, I was thinking, yes, I, I, I'm a Californian and I'd like to live here my whole life because it's a great place. And now I, I really would like to get, you know, somewhere else. All of my life I felt very comfortable here, but just recently I've had some misgivings, some thoughts. I think like a number of Californians, we're looking more and more towards other states as maybe better places to live. The myth of the Golden State is dead. California isn't what it used to be. We are not the land of milk and honey. We've been hit hard by natural disasters. We've been hit hard by the recession. And we've been hit hard by a crisis in self-esteem. It seems almost unnatural for such words to be heard in this land of such natural beauty, such wealth. This is America's richest state, turning out more than $800 billion every year in goods and services. By itself, it would be the eighth richest nation on Earth. Its 32 million people give California more political clout in Congress than any state has ever had. But this year, there's a very different spirit abroad, a sense of doubt about the future and a sense of anger at a government that has seemed unable to protect citizens from threats to their money or their safety. More than any single issue, it's that spirit that is driving California politics this year. And if history is any guide, as California goes, so goes America. In a sense, the troubles began here, with the end of the Cold War and with the sharp cutback in defense contracts and military spending, two key pillars of California's post-war economic boom. It created not just a recession, but a different kind of recession from ones in the past that had affected mostly blue-collar assembly line workers. It hit middle-class, white-collar jobs in the southern part of the state, people working in the aerospace industry, people working in the defense industry. For Chuck Hunter, the worry is that he will never be able to afford the middle-class life that his father achieved. He, he raised four kids and, you know, we had two cars and a house and all that and my wife and I today are both working and, and not, we couldn't do that, you know, if we, if we had to. By the end of 1993, the sour economy had helped make Pete Wilson one of the most endangered governors in the country. By every normal political sign, Californians were expected to turn to an attractive new face. In this case, California State Treasurer Kathleen Brown. Her father, Pat, had governed during the boom years of the 1950s and 1960s. Her brother, Jerry, had been an early voice of environmental concern and limits to growth in the 1970s. My assignment, my mission in restoring the California promises we hurdle towards the 21st century is to integrate those two traditions. But something very strange has happened. A public clearly anxious about its economic future has apparently turned away from the whole idea that the government can do very much to make that future better. Instead, it has seized on other hot-button issues, none hotter than illegal immigration. For decades in California, immigrants, legal and illegal, have been a source of cheap labor on the farms, in the fields, in the nurseries of the well-to-do. Now that issue looks very different. It took the recession, it took the recession, it took something to make the cost much more salient to Californians before they were sort of jolted out of what I think was a kind of uh, benign attitude about immigration in the state. They keep coming. Two million illegal immigrants in California. Wilson has been demanding that the federal government secure the border with Mexico and also reimburse the state for the billions he says it costs to care for illegal immigrants in public schools and hospitals. But when the campaign began, he took that illegal immigration issue and made it his issue number one by strongly backing ballot proposition 187, the so-called Save Our State initiative. It would make illegal aliens ineligible for welfare, public schooling, and all but emergency health care. The state taxpayers of this state are paying almost 10% of the annual California State General Fund budget to provide services for illegal immigrants. 
Now that is, that's absurd. And it is unfair. And Kathleen Brown? She found herself in a political trap. The public overwhelmingly backs Proposition 187. But her core political base strongly opposes it. Her constituencies are on the other side of that issue. Liberals, minorities, labor, teachers, all of whom have a stake in defeating SOS, in allowing immigration to continue. This is where Kathleen Brown comes from. In fact, no one really knows whether illegal immigrants cost more in services than they pay in sales and other taxes. But most Californians believe they're a drain on scarce public services. And images like these reinforce the idea that the illegals are all Hispanics. In fact, they come from all over the world. Surveys show the measure will likely pass with a big majority. And that's helped carry Wilson to a lead in the governor's race. But Wilson is also benefiting from another long, potent political issue. Wilson's push for a tough one-strike law. Life in prison for rapists and child molesters on their first conviction. The statistics say that crime in California has actually dipped a bit in the last 10 years. But in a political sense, that really doesn't matter. What has made crime the political equivalent of a sledgehammer isn't just the level of crime, but the kind of crime that seems to threaten people where they live. It's the kind of stark fear triggered by a crime like the murder of Polly Class, kidnapped out of her own suburban home by a convicted and paroled sexual predator. It's the kind of fear triggered by drive-by shootings, where anyone, anywhere, can be a random victim. Crime is different now uh, than even five years ago, and certainly different than 20 years ago. It is random, it is violent, it is brutal, and it can explode in any community. And it feeds in to the anxiety of Californians. It feeds in to the insecurity of Californians. It feeds into the possibility that Californians can no longer keep control of their green dream. They no longer have control of their quality of life. For Kathleen Brown, crime, like the immigration issue, proved a political trap. Her longtime personal opposition to the death penalty clearly left her vulnerable to Wilson's enthusiastic support for capital punishment. So Brown has tried to personalize the crime issue, as she did in a recent television debate. And you cannot imagine what it's like to be a mother waiting at home late at night for your kids to come home, waiting for your daughter to come home in the evening, and having her come home and comfort her because she's been raped. But crime and illegal immigration aren't just political issues. They go to the heart of the growing feeling in California and elsewhere that the government can't or won't do anything about what people really want it to do. And in a minute, we'll see how that plays out in one California town, as well as in what must be one of the most unusual Senate races anywhere in the country. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Lexus. What could possibly be as precise as the tolerances within one of the finest Swiss watches available? How about some of the tolerances within the engine and suspension of one of the finest automobiles available? The newest Lexus ES300. Let others follow. You know, I was expecting big savings when I switched from AT&T. Not to worry. Today, I've got an even better plan for your business with even bigger savings. Maybe this time I should check that out by calling this number here. <laughs> Not sure about those big savings? For the facts, call 1-800-COMPARE and AT&T will guarantee you competitive long-distance prices. Let me get you another coffee. Right after I call 1-800-COMPARE. 1-800-COMPARE. The number other long-distance companies don't want you to call. Phone's dead. Oh, how strange. AT&T. For the life of your business. You know Pat Robertson, the spiritual leader of millions who commands powerful political influence. But do you know Pat Robertson, the salesman, peddling vitamins and cosmetics from the Holy Land? A primetime investigation, Thursday. Cancer 
Circuit City really promise you your favorite music at the right price right now? With every CD, just $12.95 or less, and thousands of CDs under 10 bucks, what do you think? Circuit City, the right prices right now. While serving as Ronald Reagan's press secretary, I was almost killed by a handgun. We think you should know where the candidates stand on gun violence. Brian Belbray was the only vote against a county provision to melt down confiscated guns. Belbray is an extremist who even opposed a ban on assault weapons. Lynn Schenck was a leader in the fight to pass the assault weapons ban. That's why Jim and I hope you'll vote for Lynn Schenck, a real leader who is working to make San Diego safer. I'd like you to take a look at this picture. It's a picture of one of the most influential political figures in California, which is a little odd because he's been dead for almost 50 years. He's Hiram Johnson, former governor, former senator, one of the pioneers of ballot box populism, the idea that voters could go to the polls and with their votes enact laws that the state legislatures wouldn't or couldn't. Uh, in the past 30 years, Californians have used this power to signal a lot of important national trends. Uh, the backlash against civil rights in 1964 with, by striking down fair housing laws, the tax revolt through Proposition 13 of 1978, they enacted term limits against their own politicians in 1990. Now, with propositions about crime and illegal immigrants cracking down on both those groups, almost sure to pass, Californians seem to be telling us something about how they regard government in its capacity to do anything about the issues that most concern them. I think that the states have become extremely lax on the criminals. We're two people that are afraid when we come home at, at night. Uh, we never were before. No one's answering our questions. Not, they're just saying, well, we'll work on it. But they're not telling us what, what exactly they're going to do. You hear that sort of thing all over. Take Stockton, for example, an inland port city of some quarter million people. Every year, more than a billion dollars worth of agricultural products from the rich San Joaquin Valley is shipped inland to the coast and to the world. And here in the heartland of the state, they also say it's just not the same California anymore. While the land is incredibly rich, the economy has been battered here too, undermining some long-held assumptions. Probably 20 years ago, you could graduate from high school, you could get a job at a cannery, and you would be, have a good job for life, good enough money to buy a home, and have probably some health insurance for your family, and those jobs are not here anymore. And, and the people who want those jobs are certainly here. That's meant more people on welfare, more of the kind of troubles people used to think could never touch Stockton. Drugs, gang wars, homicide and less of what people once took for granted. As a city ourselves, we have cut down our library hours. We have cut out city, social, city services. We don't mow the yards in our city parks as much. We don't water them. We don't sweep our streets as often. Sylvia Sun Minnick, a Republican city councilwoman in Stockton, can trace her California roots back more than 125 years. She says that hard economic times have made welfare and illegal immigration prime, legitimate topics. So those are the things that have changed California, or at least changed the people's attention to what is wrong with our state. Diane Barth, who writes for the Stockton Observer, has, agrees. You know, in the years past, in the 70s and 80s, illegal immigrants were sure welcome, and farmers fought to keep them. And now, yeah, it's changed a little. And, and people feel like, uh, well, I have to, somehow, something's wrong. I need a reason why California is floundering as it is. But longtime conservative Hugh Hewitt sees something more in what the California electorate is up to. What is up in California right now is a populist, Perot-style, quiet revolution against government at every level. It's a rejection of the claim to competence on the part of the federal government and also to the part of the state government. That's exactly what worries some of California's old warriors on the left. People like Reverend Cecil Williams, pastor of the Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco, who has been on the social barricade since the early 1960s. When I came here 30 years ago, I thought it was the most fertile ground for change. It, it is the most fertile ground now for going back. 
It is now this state, which used to be the forerunner, sort of the forefront, where upheavals did occur, where there was dissent, where people came together in the new movements, created new movements, is not that way anymore. I don't, I don't know where it is. It's certainly not in California. We need to have a governor who can lay out that plan and that strategy to build a new California. If Captain Hewitt and Williams Brown, are right, it spells bad it news for Kathleen Brown, plan. who's now emphasizing her 62-page plan for California's future. If people have essentially given up on government, this may not be the right message right now. But a surge of anti-government sentiment may be more significant in the other big race out here. It may have propelled one of the unlikeliest of candidates into a close race for a seat in the United States Senate. Huffington or Feinstein, the choice is yours. Michael Huffington is the amiable heir to a Texas oil fortune who settled in California just three years ago, then spent more than $5 million of his own money to oust a veteran Republican member of the House of Representatives. He began running for the U.S. Senate almost immediately, a race in which he will almost certainly spend well over $20 million from his own fortune. His opponent? Uh, I want to thank the sheriffs and the police organizations represented here today uh, for this endorsement. Senator Dianne Feinstein, who narrowly lost a governor's race four years ago, then won a landslide election to the Senate in 1992. She courageously voted for the largest deficit reduction in history and for the balanced budget amendment. She's one of the most familiar political faces in the state, which this year may be more of a problem than an asset. Does that sound a little odd? Maybe, but it is a key to what's happening out in California this odd political year. Ordinarily, if a candidate like Huffington pumps $17 million of his own wealth into his political campaign, that would be a liability. This year, it just seems to show Huffington's independence. Ordinarily, Huffington's almost complete lack of a record as a congressman would be bad political news. Not this year. In fact, Huffington has said publicly he wants a government that does nothing. And when Dianne Feinstein boasts of using her political clout to help a business in Huffington's district, he replies that her bringing home the bacon is nothing but pork. Feinstein says she helped a company in Huffington's district. Why? On November 29th, Feinstein received her first $1,000 contribution from that company. Mike Huffington doesn't take special interest money. Feinstein so Feinstein has been fighting back not by attacking Huffington's public records, but his money. claims to business yeah. success. The Sacramento Bee reports that state records show a bankrupt Huffington company owes California $6.7 million in back taxes. Huffington and his wife, author socialite Ariana Stasinopoulos, have been the target of a barrage of media criticism, challenging everything from his business career to his house record to her involvement with a fringe religious group. None of it has stopped him. And as for his money in media... Our candidates who run for statewide office don't meet with voters. They don't make speeches. Uh, out there in the garden groups, they don't go talking to the, the soccer clubs, they don't interact with regular voters. And in essence, uh, Huffington is the sort of, um, if you like, the culmination of this trend in California, a candidate who is being marketed to us. Which leaves us looking out on this strange political landscape. A state where an incumbent governor who presided over a four-year recession has built a solid lead on issues that have almost nothing to do with the economy, and where a Senate candidate has made once fatal liabilities a set of virtues. California has such political clout that both of the winning candidates in these races are going to be considered for future national office. But I think what California will also tell us is just how deep and how strong this revolt against government may be running. Aaron? Jeff, things that start in California rarely end there. This hasn't, uh, doesn't appear this can end there either. Uh, there are about a half a dozen states where political virgins, people who've never held or run for political office, are making that lack of experience a major political message. So Election Day is going to tell us something very important about how that trend is going. Let's talk a little bit more about that, a couple of other things after a break. We'll continue with Jeff Greenfield in just a moment. You always had dreams, big dreams. 18-room castle of the sand dreams. Hey, you were going to pitch game seven of the big series, remember? You were going to frug with the go-go girls on Hullabaloo. Yeah. You were going to learn bar chords and jam with Blue Oyster Cult. Dreams. Dreams are what drive us. But sometimes life is good. You get to drive your dream. Chaka, 
It kills the germs that cause bad breath. It fights plaque and the gum infection gingivitis. It's a new taste, new feeling, new sensation. New Fresh Burst Listerine. Don't miss Goodyear's Big Tire Sale and 25% savings on four of our most popular radials for passenger cars and light trucks. But you gotta hurry. The Big Tire Sale ends November 5th at participating Goodyear retailers. Next time, airline tickets. Where do you really get the best prices? Plus, Koki Roberts and Matthew Broderick on the next Good Morning America. Here on ABC. The issue in the race for Congress, who will create jobs here, not Mary Alice Acevedo? Instead of employing workers here, Acevedo employs 900 low-paid workers abroad, then sells the products back here. Acevedo's lumber company pled guilty to charges of dumping hazardous waste, and incredibly, Mary Alice Acevedo voted no to legislation to help our small businesses, no to the California Job Creation Act. We need someone who will fight for jobs here, not Mary Alice Acevedo. At first glance, the Mercedes C-Class is impressive. But if you look a little closer, it becomes remarkable. Anti-lock brakes, more powerful headlamps, eight-speaker sound system. Oh yes, and an electric sunroof. Test drive the C-Class at your authorized Mercedes dealer. Sometimes people need a reason to straighten out their lives. For me, it was fear. I honestly believed I was about to die. But the better alternative is discipline, hard work, and faith in the future. And that's the message I take to young people. I'm Neil Seiler, and Tom Connolly helped me kick drugs and stay clean. Helping kids to help themselves is why I want to keep this job. Assemblyman Connolly serves the people of La Mesa, El Cajon, Chula Vista, Lemon Grove, and San Diego. Continuing with uh, ABC's Jeff Greenfield. Jeff, there must be a common denominator here that ties uh, the, the state of California and all of the horrible problems it's had with eastern Washington, which has had very few problems actually in the last few years, or Texas or Florida or whatever, but where incumbents are in serious, serious trouble to, to, to as you described it, political virgins. I think what unites them was, was best shown two years ago in the fact that Ross Perot, a very unlikely candidate, uh, got almost 20% of the vote in the general presidential election. I think a lot of Americans have become process radicals, not left-wing radicals or right-wing radicals, but just fed up with the whole idea that government can do anything but raise their taxes, write a regulation, or somehow not deal with an issue like crime. And I think that pervasive mood is what's giving a lot of these political neophytes uh, the chance to run very competitive races. But is there any evidence out there that you see that voters are really willing to give up that which they get from government or they just want to rail against government? No, wh where the process is stuck is that people don't like government in the abstract. But when you tell them, okay, well, let's cut back on Social Security benefits, Medicare, veterans benefits, or, or some of the traditional pork, it's a much different mood. I think what, what we really ought to wait and see for 1996 is whether a third party or independent candidate emerges who's going to directly address the issue of, well, if you don't like government, here's what you're going to have to give up. Right. There's two questions there, isn't there? Will an independent candidate emerge and will that be, be the message? It seems to me we're setting the stage absolutely for somebody or buddies to make an, an independent run. Oh, I, I would bet serious money, if it were legal, of course, <laughs> that there'd be at least one and maybe more independent candidates in 1996. Whether the argument against entitlements as a way of cutting back the power of government resonates, uh, boy, that's the real $64 question, as they used to say. In 10 seconds, do you think there's going to be a massive uh, uh, upheaval here that incumbents are, are really going to get thrown out on Election Day? I think, I think it's going to be very bad news this year for Democrats. Some of the incumbents are going to survive because they always do. Jeff, thank you. As always, Jeff Greenfield. We'll wrap it up in just a moment.
restored people's faith in the quality of American luxury cars, but it has a way of rejuvenating the soul as well. You've got customers who demand, information to command, and competition to withstand. So how's your business to expand? Here's how. Sprint Business introduces Real Solutions, a top-to-bottom action plan that shows where your business stands versus the competition and offers communication solutions to help your business grow. And it's all free. Call now for Real Solutions. 1-800-816-REAL. Only from Sprint Business. Not in this car. Avis announces Avis Satellite Guidance, now being road tested in California. One more way the employee owners of Avis are making the future safer, faster, and better. It's how most of us got here. It's how this country was built. American citizenship is a treasure beyond measure. But now the rules are being broken. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. To reward the wrong way is not the American way. Pete Wilson has had the courage to say enough is enough and to stand up for Californians who work hard, pay taxes, and obey the laws. That's why we need Pete Wilson as governor. Art Torres, after 20 years in the legislature, he's really out of touch. He voted to provide workers' comp benefits to prison inmates. He voted to allow convicted sex offenders to teach in the public schools. He voted for the Inmate Bill of Rights. And Torres criticized the Three Strikes Law as a product of middle-class fears. The choice? Chuck Quackenbush, co-author of the Three Strikes Law. And he wrote the law to prosecute teenage murderers as adults. The closer you look, the clearer the choice. Tomorrow on Prime Time, you know him from the pulpit and high-profile politics. But what you don't know about Pat Robertson will surprise you. That's on Prime Time tomorrow on this ABC station. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Aaron Brown, Ian Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. If you wish a printed transcript of Nightline, please call 1-800-ALL-NEWS. If you wish a video cassette version, the cost is $14.98 plus $3.95 for shipping and handling. Please call 1 800 ABC 9420. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. A murder is going to take place, Ben, and I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to tell you where, I'm going to tell you when, I'm even going to tell you who's going to do it. A game of Clue turns deadly, and this time it's personal. You murdered my friend. An all-new Matlock, Thursday on ABC. A recent Channel 10 editorial said vote no on state ballot proposition 184. Here with an editorial reply, Kelly Rudiger of the Doris Tate Crime Victims Bureau. The RAND Corporation predicts that Proposition 184, three strikes and you're out, will reduce serious and violent crime by as much as 34%. The Office of Planning and Research says the reduced crime from three strikes will save the people of California billions of dollars more than it will ever cost because we will no longer have to put the same criminal through the system time and time again. We will no longer have to pay the $112 billion price tag that crime costs Californians each year. But more importantly, we won't have to pay with the lives of victims. It is better to fill up our jails with repeat, serious, and violent criminals than it is to fill up our hospitals and morgues with more victims. My brother Jeffrey was murdered when he was 16 years old. Young kids should not have to die before we put criminals behind bars. I urge you to vote yes on Proposition 184. It will save both lives and taxpayer dollars for the sake of the victims, for the sake of our children, and for your own sake. Please vote yes on 184. Kelly Rudiger with an editorial reply.
Student loan fraud has cost taxpayers billions. Some controversial schools are run by National Education Corporation, whose largest stockholder is Richard Blum's company, Diane Feinstein's husband. National Education got over $100 million in federal funds since Feinstein became senator. While Feinstein voted four times for the program, giving it $4 billion, her husband's company made millions from taxpayers. Feinstein, a senator who serves special interests and her own. Kathy Wright, with a background in business, she went to Sacramento and was a strong force behind the one-strike law for child molesters and rapists. Chuck Quackenbush, a small businessman and legislator who wrote the law to prosecute teenage murderers as adults. Maureen DeMarco, California's first cabinet secretary for children and education. She demands mandatory expulsion from school for drugs, violence, or weapons. Wright, Quackenbush, DeMarco, a crime-fighting team for California. Can we trust Congressman Huffington? He claims he's for cutting government spending, but the hypocrisy index of the National Taxpayers Union lists Huffington because he promised to vote for big spending cuts, but voted for huge spending increases instead. Add that to the nearly seven million in taxes a Huffington company owes California, and the millions in income taxes Huffington avoided by claiming a Texas residency, and you're beginning to know Congressman Huffington, the Texas oil millionaire Californians just can't trust. 10 stands for San Diego. 10 stands for news. In this tough political climate, there's one candidate.